Did anybody go home and rewatch the video from yesterday? I tried to, but I didn't want to rewatch it. Okay, so number three from that A plus thing I gave you on Monday is a painful problem. And it's only painful depending on how you choose to do it. Because um, they say, okay, here's a series centered at 1. F is the function given by the sum. So here's the first thing I would do. F is the function given by the sum of the first three non-zero terms. So I would start off by saying, okay, well, maybe F of X is, or not maybe, F of X is the first three terms. So I'll start, oh, notice it starts at 1, not 0. So it's going to be negative 1 squared, which is positive, n minus x minus 1 to the first over 1. I'll plug in 2 for n. That'll be minus x minus 1 squared over 2 plus x minus 1 cubed over 3. So there's my f of x. There's my f of x. Any questions there? That's pretty easy. All right. Then here's where if you choose the wrong approach, you're really going to hate yourself. The maximum value of this. Now, what is that referencing? Uh, let's go more generic. It doesn't have to be Lagrange. It's, it's, uh, it's referencing the error, right? This is talking about error. This is talking about error. Um, and so when it comes to error in estimating things, when it comes to error in estimating things, you have three options. Uh, now we're most recently covered Lagrange, Lagrange, Lagrangi. Um, so we're thinking that it could be Lagrange, but it could also be, this is an alternating series, so you could use the alternating series error test. And if you want to challenge yourself, we could actually do the antiderivative of this also. We could do the integral test for error. And so we don't know which of the methods they would have used here. It's also going to be really weird because if we did choose Lagrange, we would have to find the fourth derivative of the function, right? Because that's how you find your m value. And we don't know what f is. We just have the Taylor approximation for it. All right, so actually that means Lagrange is out. We could try the alternating series, right? But again, the problem is... I don't know. <laughs> Wait, it sounds like a dolphin. All right. Um, okay, so all the problems we're having here, it can be Lagrange because there's no way for us to get the fourth derivative to figure out what m is. If we tried the alternating series test, you would want to... Um, oh, well, I guess we could do... It would be the fourth derivative of ln x. I'm sorry, so I'm wrong. It wouldn't be f of x because f is the approximation. But there... Right, f is the first three terms, but we're, but f is an approximation of the, the, the f, the, see, that's the problem, I shouldn't have used f. The fourth derivative that we find is not the fourth derivative of the series, it's the fourth derivative of the original function that the series approximates. Right, so that was actually, that was an error in what I said. So uh, the way this is worded, it looks like the function we're approximating would be ln x. And so I could find the fourth derivative of that. So, so I take it back, Lagrange may be on the table back again, unfortunately. I, just, I was just so anxious to get it out, uh, uh, get, make it not an option. I would still want to go alternating, because if we went with the alternating series, your, your error is at most the fourth term, right? And so that could be another approach. Right? The problem is you're supposed to have, like, some values to plug in, right? Like, usually you're saying, okay, estimate f of one-third, and then you plug in one-third for all the x's, and then whatever this fourth value is, that's your max error and all that mess. Um, we kind of do have values of 0.3 and 1.7, but x could also be 0.5 or 1.2 or something like that. Kind of ugly, right? right? So when I first did this problem, I was locked into all of these error approximation techniques. I was locked into them. And then I was like, I'm an idiot. I wanted so bad to use calculus to answer this question. And I was like, how about we just do this? We want the error we want to know the maximum value of this. How about I just define that to be a function? Let's say g of x is the absolute value of the natural log of x minus f of x. And I want to find the maximum of that function. How, would you, how do you find the maximum of a function? Yeah, 
know, you're thinking local. We're on a closed interval, so this would be like an absolute. You would need to consider endpoints, critical numbers, find the values, right? But I wouldn't even go that far because this is a calculator problem. I'm going to be ultra lazy. I'm actually going to go to my calculator and just graph the function ln x minus x minus 1. Actually, can I do this? I'll go ahead and distribute a negative. Minus x minus 1 plus x minus 1 squared over 2 minus x minus 1 cubed over 3. Graph that, change my window to negative 3 to 1.7, and use the maximum command on the, on the calculator to get the answer. Right. So, so, so th the problem is it's presented as a series problem. And you have to have a, a basic understanding of series to be able to plug in your first three terms to get f. But after that, let's go as easy as possible because it is calculator. Graph that, find the maximum. Good? Yeah? Yeah? Because I wanted y'all to be tempted to use Lagrange. <laughs> No, the maximum value. It is referencing error. The, I'm, I'm ignoring that fact in, the, in my approach, though. So, like, so, so when you see the maximum value of the set function, I didn't even notice. They gave you the function up here. Did y'all notice that? I didn't even notice they named the function that the series approximates. Whoops. Um, I'm sorry, I cut you off as I had that realization. What did you ask? Um, it's not the it's not the maximum value. It's the absolute value of the actual function minus the approximation, the Taylor. That's the thing that's referencing error. Error. We get, Do we want to solve that in the calculator real quick? Since we've gone this far, no. I don't even know what the answer is. Is it C? It's C. <laughs> it's cool. It's like a double entendre. Entendre to the French. Okay. All right, so moving on. Okay, so the free response question I wanted to look at was, can we read that? What does that say? 2007B, probably six. They're all six. 2007B, where are we? It's in here somewhere. There it is. This problem would be non-calculator. This is a non-calculator. I'll give you all a few minutes to look at it and see if you can have any uh, luck with parts A and B, and then we'll go over it. Okay. Yeah. All right, there's my A. So I pause it. Here we go. Um, starting with just your memorized series for E. Have you all memorized your E sine and cosine yet? E is the easiest one. No pun intended. But. Yep. Okay, uh, so there's E. And then to get e to the negative x squared, you simply replace all of the x's in the series with negative x squared. You don't necessarily have to clean it up, but uh, typically, typically after part a, you then have to use that series to answer all the rest of them, so it helps to have it simplified. So we wrote the first not four non-zeros and the general term. I think I may go ahead and put plus dot, 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 because it doesn't really end there. I don't know. Or maybe I won't. I can't decide. I'll just put it. Okay, uh, have we looked at B yet? Probably. If you ever see a limit, you can almost bet that it's going to be loped. The exception would be the limit involved in an improper integral. But the overwhelming majority of limits can be loped. Or you have a memorized, because you should have this limit memorized. Like, at, n approaches infinity of like 1 plus 3 over n to the negative n. You should know what that is. Just, no, just negative 3. E to the negative 3. So, so, which, that one would be lopable also. If you forgot that, lope would get you through it. But yeah, if you ever see a limit, you can almost bet that it will be loped. Should we just go ahead and do this one? First step to every limit, 
plug in and make sure it's indeterminate before you dive into L'Hopital's rule. So if I plug in zero, you have one minus zero squared minus f of zero over zero to the fourth. What is f of zero? Yeah, because f of x is e to the negative x squared, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Here's one thing you have to be careful. They explicitly said use your answer to part A. That means we cannot substitute e to the negative x squared in for f. That would be not using the answer to part A. Right? So we have to use the answer to part A. Um, now, I can still, so this series is an approximation for f of x, and 0 is the center. So I can still, that was a horrible approximation symbol. That's a little better. Um, so I can still uh, use that. I can plug in 0, right? So f of 0 would be 1. So we have 1 minus 1 over 0. So it's indeterminate. That means we can loop it. Um, now, I always, just for the sake of making it clear to you what I'm doing and anybody else who comes back and looks at the notes, I always make a declaration that we're doing L'Hopital's rule. You don't have to do that. If you just write limit and you magically have the derivative, the reader is going to know what you did. So, so I, I like to write low because it makes me feel good. So the limit as n, no n, x approaches infinity, 0 of 1, it's going to be negative 2x minus f prime of x all over 4x cubed. Oh my gosh, I'm scared of this. Oh, you know what? You know what I might do? Yeah. Yeah, th that just occurred to me. That just occurred. Well, well, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. It just occurred to me that if I substituted this whole thing, if I substituted the series in for f, then some stuff will cancel. The ones will cancel. You could factor an x out and cancel some of the x's on the bottom, right? So while what I'm doing is not wrong, I'm now going to abandon this, abandon ship. You don't have to give it up. You're just abandoning it. Okay. Um, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start over, and I'm going to say this limit is the same thing as limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus x squared minus that whole function up here, which I'm going to in one step, and that's dangerous, go ahead and distribute the negative. So 1 minus 1 plus x squared. Oh, my gosh. Sorry. She got really excited x to the fourth over 2. Now I'm going to be dangerous here also. I'm also going to factorialize the 3 over 6. Uh, then it would be technically minus a bunch of stuff. And hopefully that bunch of stuff doesn't come into play over x to the fourth. And look how beautiful this gets. This was definitely the better approach. I was going to make this really painful. All right? What happens? 1 minus 1 is 0. Negative x squared plus x squared is 0. We're left with that. And what can I do with that? Oh, come on. You can factor an x to the fourth out on the top now, which will leave me with negative one half minus or plus x squared over six minus a bunch of other stuff over x to the fourth. The x to the fourths cancel. And now I can just plug in zero. Negative one half plus. Now the the next term is zero squared over six. Will all of the rest ones the rest ones? Will all the I like that. We'll go with it. Will all the rest ones be zeros also? Yeah, it's going to be plus zero plus zero plus zero. So the answer is negative one half. That was a little bit easier than doing. What? Well, okay. If I had continued with this approach, I would have had to figure out what f prime of x is. I'm sorry. F prime, yeah, f prime is zero which I can do because there is no x to the first term, which means f prime of 0 is 0, which do they be 0 over 0 again. So then I'll have to do another round of derivatives and be negative 2 minus f double prime of 0, which I could figure out. So it will just take a little bit more ugliness and loping. But so it wasn't wrong, just evil. Okay, moving on. We are recording, yes, okay. Okay, we get to do it all over again. Okay.
Okay, so the first four non-zero terms for that. Ooh, how do I want to do that? I'll freeze it and see what y'all can do. Now remember, that is this series that we generated in part A. That is the series for, I'll, I'll take off e to the x. That, that is approximately the series for e to the negative x squared, right? So we have one option of saying, why don't we just do that integral from 0 to x of that, except it has to be in terms of t, but that's pretty easy. All I have to do is write t instead of an x. Minus t to the 7 over 7, well, 6 over 6. And it does ask for only the first four non-zero. When you do an antiderivative, no, those will not go away, right? So it would be plus da 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 da. I'll just put dt, which would be t minus t cubed over 3 plus t to the 5th over 10 minus t to the 7th over 42 plus da 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 evaluated from 0 to x, which means now we just plug the x's back in. x minus x cubed over 3 plus x to the 5th over 10 minus x to the 7th over 42. And those are the first four non-zero terms. It doesn't say anything about um, a general term. If you do more terms than that, you miss it because you didn't follow their instructions. So they're the first four terms. And use the first two to estimate that. What would zero to one half be? saying the answer to that part of it because it's kind of a two question thing. There's the answer to the first question. The answer to the second question will be approximately what you get when you plug one half into the first terms of that answer. Do you want to clean that up? One eighth over three is one twenty fourth, which ends up being eleven over twenty four. I have heard, although I don't know this because I've never graded AP exams. Did I tell you all that I was invited to read AP exams this year? Yeah. yeah. So, so depressing. I know. Maybe I can just take him with me. We could give birth in St. Louis. Or she could. I mean, I'm. Anyway. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. I have heard that they are very, very picky when it comes to equality versus approximation. And so. Um, e to the negative x squared is approximately that series. We are approximating that sum. But it's OK for me to put an equal sign here, because what I'm saying with that step is that 1 minus 1 half cubed over 3 is equal to this thing, right? But the whole thing is an approximation to the original. Are we good? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if they count off for that. Um, Let's just write approximate and equal for all of them, everything. So we'll do this for every single problem. <laughs> it's approximately equal to approximation. OK, uh, the other option, just so you could see where my brain was, and I'm trying to decide if, it's a, um, if this would have been quicker. This way, honestly, that was a fairly direct approach. Is that safe to say? Like you substitute the stuff back in, do the antiderivative plug-in. Um, the other option, what I was thinking is I was saying, uh, I don't like it when they give me functions without naming them. So I would say, hey, why don't we just say let um, h of x, I don't know why I chose h instead of g, but let h of x equal this, right? Right? Uh, and then through the magic of the fundamental theorem of calculus, I automatically know that h prime of x is equal to e to the negative x squared. Right? Which means that the series I have here is h prime. So therefore, h prime of x is approximately this thing. 1 minus x squared plus x to the fourth over 2 factorial minus x to the sixth over 3 factorial plus dot, 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 dot. And h of x would be the antiderivative of that. Right? Which will be x minus x cubed over 3. Um, oh, you, geez. 
plus x to the fifth over stuff. And you it, get it the same end game. So I guess it's about it ended up being about the same amount of work, didn't it? Good. I guess it was like one less step. Right? If you look at line per line. Right? And then that integral is the same thing as h of one half would be approximately what we just got, 11 over 24. Okay, now I just realized earlier, as I was writing, I believe this line, I kind of stopped in the middle and went, oh my gosh, and then I just kept going. Um, any idea what that realization was that I had? Any idea? We did an antiderivative, and an antiderivative would include a plus c. Agreed? Oh, but you know what? Here's where we get lucky. Here's here's where we here's where we get lucky with this approach because it's a definite integral, plus c is not needed, and plugging in the x and the zero and subtracting uh, kind of does the plus c for you. If you go this route, if you go this route, your h of x is actually ungroup, uh, whatever, is actually all of that stuff plus c, right? Because I just did a general antiderivative for that one. And then we've got to figure out how we're going to solve for plus c. Any idea how we would know that c must be 0? Why? Yeah, because h of 0 would be the area from 0 to 0, which would have to equal 0, which means that c would have to equal 0. So you would have to, it, on that approach on the right side, you would actually have to make some conscious choice about your c to realize that it is 0. Yeah, right. Because because this approach, what I did is I started with that being h, and I identified h prime, and that yeah, and that that step when I went from h to h prime completely did away with the integral. Yeah, yeah. And so then h of one half still ends up being eleven twenty fourths. Okay, what do we think? Good, bad, pretty bad. Well, let's move on. Um, explain why the answer in part C differs from the actual value of 1 over stuff by less than 1 over 200. What do we think of that one? Would we have to find the fourth derivative? Why would you need the fourth derivative? Okay, so you can find the maximum value of all that mess. Is that okay? You're doing Lagrange. No. I, I take that back. It's not wrong. It's very. It's going to be very difficult because e to the negative t squared, by the time you get to the fourth derivative, you're going to be doing a lot of product rules. It's not going to be nice. Now, if it were just e to the x, it may not be as bad. Right. What? Yeah. Uh, well, you... You have to do no. You'd be fourth because we used a third degree polynomial, right? Even though even though the next term in the series is a fifth term, but but that is third degree, so n would be f uh, three, and we have to find the fourth. Um, we would actually need to find the fourth derivative. I thought I had my pen. We would actually need to find the fourth derivative if we went with Lagrange, the fourth derivative of x for the original function f of x, which is e to the negative x squared, not the series, which that'd be kind of painful. First derivative is easy, second derivative is product rule, and every derivative after that is going to be an extra product rule. Okay, uh, do not do Lagrange. As a matter of fact, when you see a reference to error, Lagrange, unless it's explicitly stated in the problem, Lagrange should be your last option. How many ways do we know to estimate error? Three. One of them is painfully easy. The other two, not so much. What's the painfully easy method? the alternating series error where your error is less than your first omitted term. Do we have an alternating series? Yes. So don't use Lagrange. Not only is alternating series easier, is that test easier, but it's also more accurate. It gives you a smaller maximum error than Lagrange would. So it's easier and more accurate. So two good reasons to use that. No, it, I don't think so. I don't think so. It could be that when you do the alternate, let's see what the alternating series test is. Error first is first. So explain why. So your max error in a convergent 
alternating series approximation is less than the first omitted term, and you do have to say this, because it does say explain why. Um, which is, and my next term, my first omitted term would actually be, so I plugged in one half, it will be one half to the fifth over 10, which is one over 320, which is less than one over 100. Uh, 200, thank you, one over 200. Are we good? We're good. So now back to the question. Is, would Lagrange work? And it might. The problem is Lagrange doesn't give you as accurate of an error. It could give you a larger error. And so if we went look. Yeah. Yes. Do you have Jen's bell? I do not. Okay, thanks. She's got an excused absence, I think. That's weird. Okay. Um, hey, she might get to hear her call over the intercom on the video. How cool would that be? <laughs> Probably. Anyway, um, so back to what I was saying. Lagrange, you could do Lagrange completely correctly, and Lagrange may come back and say the maximum possible error is like 1 over 197. Right? And so, uh, 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 so, now that's a big difference also. Like going from 1 over 320 with the alternating series to that with Lagrange, is, it's kind of a big jump. So I don't think that would happen. It would probably work as well, but it could. Yes. Yes. I'm going to try to sound, answer this without insulting you, but that's because I used the first two terms in part C, and so the third one is the first submitted one. Okay. Is that is that okay? <laughs> Are we good? What do we think, people? Are we slowly getting Are we slowly getting there with series? Slowly. Is it as bad as Is, is it getting better? It's, surely it's getting a little bit better. The good news is The good news is you know a free response question is coming on the AP exam. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say that. We won't get very far on this one, but I want to look at this one, too. Um, they have always asked a Taylor series on the AP exam. Always. For BC, anyway. They've never done it in AB. Lucky guys. Um, but last year, I told AB they have always asked a traditional area volume question on the AP exam, and they had from 1969 through the 2016 test, and then last year they finally broke their streak. And so it kind of made me angry because that's like the one question you know is coming and you can get ready for it. So, anyway, all right, so let's see how far we can get with this one. Number this one, they give you f of x. How nice of them to give you the, oh, well, they didn't give you the McLaurin series for the one given. But still shouldn't be too bad. Yeah. To get my McLaurin series for this, ln of 1 plus x, 1 plus x, blah, 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 f of x would be approximately, not equal to, and we'll just substitute x cubed in for all the x's. So x cubed, I, got, I can't see now, minus x cubed squared would be x to the 6 over 2 plus x to the ninth over 3 minus x to the 12th over 4 plus, so write the first 4 non-zero, that's 4 non-zeros and the general, so plus dot 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 plus, and the general, negative 1 to the n plus 1, x cubed to the n would be x to the 3n over n, um, and there's your series. That's nice. I don't know if I do or not. It says first, 
Uh, the fact that they say and the general term is, I think, means that they'll be a little bit more forgiving. And now, if they just said write the first four non-zero terms with, without requiring the general, then I absolutely would just stop after the x to the 12th and not write anything else. Or if they said write the fourth degree Taylor polynomial or the 12th degree Taylor polynomial in this case. Yeah, yeah, kinda. But if you notice the one they wrote, they put dot 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 after their general term too. So, <laughs> okay. So B. So B. Is that a word? Maybe I'm thinking Kobe, like the beef. Huh? What is Kobe meat? Y'all never heard of that Kobe? Yeah, like Kobe. It's it's a type of beef. It's a type of meat. Yeah, it's beef. It's like a really, really expensive meat. Beef, yeah. Like, I wonder what makes it special. Maybe they, maybe they feed the cattle something very special. What is? Wavy lays are really good. Black cattle. That's racist. All right. The radius of convergence for the Maclaurin series of F is one. How nice of them! Determine the interval of convergence. What is so beautifully nice about this? They gave you the radius, which means we only have to test the endpoints, right? What is the center of this series? The center is zero, right? The center is zero. Therefore, if the radius is one, I know it's going to be it's going to converge somewhere from negative one. To one, we just have to figure out whether we're going to include the ends. Agreed? Yes. Agreed. So let's plug them in. So let's test x equals negative one. It's not geometric, is it? No, it's not geometric. So we have to do. We have to test the endpoints. Um, so if x is equal to negative one, this will be the sum of negative one to the n plus one times negative one to the three n all over n. And so we either have the harmonic series or an alternating harmonic series. What would this be? We need to clean it up to be sure. Because I would have to add these exponents, right? So it would be negative 1 to the 4n plus 1 over n. What's going to happen if you take negative 1 and raise it to the 4n plus 1? It's always going to be, always going to be, oh, it will be positive, sorry. <laughs> negative 1 to 4 anything is going to be, wait, no, it will be odd. See, I was right the first time. Yeah, 4n plus 1. 4n plus 1 is always odd, right? Right. So negative 1 to an odd power would be negative 1 over n. Is that going to converge or diverge? It's not alternating, people. It's not alternating. It's your negative harmonic series. So if your harmonic series diverges to positive infinity, this one's just going to negative infinity. Right? All right. I don't know what I'm writing there. Test x equals 1. This one's going to be a lot easier. If I plug in 1 for x, then we just have negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 1 to the 3n over n. And that one is going to be, that one is your alternating series. Right? And that will converge. So the interval is starting from negative 1. So 1, we will not include negative 1. We will include 1. No, you, you can do set notation if you want. That was nice. We, won't, we probably won't have time to do C, but we can read it and think about it and enjoy the, the challenge if it were to occur. Right, the first four non-zero terms for F prime of T squared. Ooh. F prime of t squared. What would that be? Let's see. I'm going to do some writing while we're thinking. F prime of t squared. So I'll come down here. I'm going to move that up here. Oh, geez. There. Come down here. Pick up. Okay, so F prime of t squared. So what would I need to do first? What would I need to do first? Yeah. 
We're going to have to plug in t squared at some point. Take the derivative first. Let's find f prime of x first, which will be 3x squared minus 6 over, oh, minus 3x to the fifth. Bring down the 9. Oh my gosh, look at this! 9 over 3 is 3. x to the eighth. I bet the next one's 3 too. It is! Minus 3, x to the 11th. So there's the first four non-zero terms of f prime and then f prime of t squared. Now we just plug t squared into that. So that'll be 3t to the 4th minus 3t to the 10th minus th plus 3t to the 16th minus 3t to the 22th. Good? Good. So uh, if g is the, oh, g, no, g is the antiderivative of that. Yeah, so now we have to do the antiderivative. Okay, well, that's kind of cool. We don't have time to do that. Maybe we can, how about we just finish this one for homework? Is that okay? Finish that one for homework. And also, and also from the sheet I gave you all yesterday that we didn't look at, this one, do the 1982 problem, which I think is the very last one. No calculators were allowed in 1982. The answers are on my webpage. The answers are on my webpage. But please, um, please give it your best effort without looking at my answers. Right? Right? Okay. I'm going to stop recording.